Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jeremiah 18 7 through 10 the instant i speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up to pull down and to destroy it if that nation against whom i have spoken turns from its evil i will relent of the disaster that i thought to bring upon it and the instant i speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit it. In Kamala's America, anything's possible. We are all unburdened by what has been. For far too long, federal prisoners were not allowed to get taxpayer-funded sex changes. But that time is now over. Kamala made sure of that when she was California Attorney General. When I was attorney general, I learned that the California Department of Corrections, which was a client of mine, they were standing in the way of, of, of surgery. Um, for prisoners. For prisoners. I worked behind the scenes to not only make sure that that transgender woman got the services she was deserving. So it wasn't only about that case. I made sure that they changed the policy in the state of California. Fast forward to today, a federal judge has ruled that an Indiana prison must provide a sex change for an inmate. And not just any inmate. This guy, Jonathan C. Richardson, also known as Autumn Cordelione, who strangled his 11-month-old stepdaughter to death. The ACLU believes it's cruel and unusual pun punishment to not provide this face tattooed baby killer a sex change on your dime. You know what's cruel and unusual? Strangling a baby. Did the ACLU think of that? Remember, Kamala Harris supports this. She fought for it in California. And she'll do it again in the White House. This is radical. It's nuts. We're paying for sex changes for baby killers in prison. What is that all about? <laughs> well, that's Kamala Harris's America, isn't it, Jesse? Thanks for having me on here. And yeah, as you just pointed out, this federal judge agreed with the ACLU that it's cruel and unusual punishment not to have the taxpayers pay for a sex change operation. And as outrageous as that sounds, what's even more outrageous is that that's Kamala Harris's position. And so no wonder that she wants to raise taxes on Americans by about $4.9 trillion because, you know, those procedures are pretty expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's exactly why... That's it's like exactly hundred thousand dollars a procedure, and this yeah, is voluntary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This isn't like emergency gallbladder surgery, Tim. You know, this isn't some something you need to get rushed to the ER for. This is elective. This prisoner can survive just fine in prison with the pieces they were born with. Yeah, exactly right. And this is exactly why we have an ad on the air right now laying this all out, laying out the whole case, videotape of Kamala Harris and the whole bit. And it's a great ad. The voters need to know about this. And the tagline is Kamala Harris is for they, them. Donald Trump is for you. Kamala supports taxpayer funded sex changes for prisoners. Surgery. Um, for prisoners. For prisoners. Every transgender inmate in the prison system would have access. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Even the liberal media was shocked Kamala supports taxpayer-funded sex changes for prisoners and illegal aliens. Every transgender inmate would have access. Kamala's for they, them. President Trump is for you. It's a great ad. It's a it great really ad. We played it last ridiculous. night. And with this country in, what, trillions in debt and inflation at record highs, you, we can't afford transgender surgeries for people on death row. No, certainly not. And that's why Donald Trump was out on the campaign trail today talking about reviving the manufacturing sector and bringing it back to life, an American industrial revolution again. That's what he's talking about. And on the other side, you have Kamala Harris talking about sex change operations paid for by the taxpayers for people serving 55 years for strangling an 11-month-old 11 11 baby. It's, it's insanity, but that's Kamala Harris's America. President Harris would be cruel and unusual punishment to the American people. Proverbs 8.13 The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. Proverbs 16.5
everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. Romans 1, 18 through 25 For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans chapter 1 tells us God has revealed to mankind that He is the Creator of all things, and that He has made it known to mankind that they are without excuse through His creation that He exists. God demands that we worship Him and recognize Him as the Creator. And when a society does not glorify Him as God, He gives them up to three phases of judgment. Romans 1 verse 24 says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts. The first phase of judgment is an impure heart. The second phase of judgment is of the body, verses 26 and 27. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. The third phase of judgment is in verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. First, the heart is rotten, then the body follows, and then the mind goes. The moral law of God written on the heart has literally been stomped out and replaced with cultural immorality. Immorality now goes in every direction. The mind is corrupt. People don't think right. They advocate all the wretched things and depreciate all the virtuous things. And what flows out of this pornographic, homosexual, depraved culture? All evil. Verses 29 through 32 being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. It is evident by looking at society that we are in the third and final judgment on America. In these last days, society has not retained God in their knowledge, and in return, God has given them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Verse 32 brings Romans chapter 1 to an end with a very bleak view of human nature. The point of the last half of the verse is to show that many people not only do things that they know deserve death, but also entice others to do them and approve when they do. In other words, the end point of depravity is not just the love affair with sin, but the desire to bring others with you to destruction. It's not just that people choose death for themselves in the passion of sin, but that they become suicidal at the spiritual level and assist others in eternal self-destruction by approving their sin. We are watching this play out right before our very eyes. Shocking scene in Philadelphia over the weekend. Watch the absolute chaos as hundreds of vehicles descend on a busy intersection. Cars did donuts while hundreds of people took to the streets, lighting fires, throwing fireworks, jumping on cars. At least five police vehicles were damaged, some with their windows smashed and their tires deflated. Several officers were hurt in that chaos. It was the 11th illegal car meetup Philly police responded to in just one weekend. Ooh. And they say someone even brought a flamethrower to one of them. <laughs> Steve, we were talking about this, the absolute devolution of society. Yeah, this, this is the collapse of civilized society, and this is normal now. I mean, you see scenes like that in Los Angeles pretty much every weekend. It's just not reported to the same degree. And it's the direct result of policy choices. Far left extremists in charge of 
DA departments and the defund the police movement, even if it's not actually defunding them, the demoralization of the police, so they feel it's, there's no point in going after this kind of behavior, and it's the collapse of law and order that we all have a right to expect. You know, I'm just worried that children like mine and others who are, you know, preteen and teenagers right now are watching this and thinking that we are devolving into something that looks like Mad Max Thunderdome. Yes. I mean, it's, it's really disturbing. It's Friday night. Do you know where your children are? Dozens of young people on bicycles stormed a 7-Eleven convenience store in Pico Robertson this Friday evening, stealing whatever they could get their hands on, including food and lottery tickets, stuffing their shirts and sweatshirts and pockets with the merchandise, ransacking and trashing the place in a matter of minutes. When it was over, the scene inside was disarray. The violent crowd scattered into the darkness as quickly as it arrived, with all of the criminal activity captured on camera and posted on social media. KTLA has covered several similar cases within the last few months. Often these types of mob scenes or blitzes will accompany a street takeover with dangerous stunts and reckless driving in an intersection. Victims and business owners are left grappling with deciding whether to clean up, keep going and risk further turmoil or close down for good. A mob of thieves hit this same convenience store back in August. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society will be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. There can be no doubt we are living in the end times right before Jesus Christ returns as we link 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 with Romans 1, 28 through 32. If we are that close to Jesus' return, then how close are we to the rapture of the church? Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Hezbollah has now ex escalated its war on Israel by targeting Tel Aviv. Israeli Defense Forces intercepted the missile believed to be headed for Mossad headquarters. Israel's defense minister says the IDF has now eliminated most of Hezbollah's top leadership. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. For the first time in the war, Hezbollah fired a ballistic missile at Tel Aviv which was intercepted by Israel's David Sling defense system. The attack represents an escalation by the Iranian-backed terror group. Despite being battered by more than 2,000 airstrikes, Hezbollah continues to launch hundreds of missiles into northern Israel. Today, 300 rockets were fired at Israel. Six civilians and soldiers were injured, most of them lightly. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu again spoke to the Lebanese people. I say to the people of Lebanon, our war is not with you. Our war is with Hezbollah. Nasrallah is leading you to the brink of the abyss. Hagari said Israel eliminated Hezbollah's commander of rockets and missiles, responsible for thousands of attacks. Fighter jets of the Air Force hit precisely one floor in a building where he was present along with other commanders in Hezbollah's rocket unit. 
Israel's Defense Minister Yoav Gallant says Israel has now eliminated nearly all of Hezbollah's top leadership. The Hezbollah of today is not the Hezbollah of a week ago. The sequence of blows it faced in its command and control, its operatives, its weapons, all these things are extremely severe blows. The Lebanese foreign minister says the number of evacuees from southern Lebanon is nearly half a million. At the United Nations, Israel's ambassador put the blame for all this fighting on Iran, which controls terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas. We will not let Iran's terrorist cronies dictate the future of our nation. President Biden, speaking at the U.N., called for a negotiated peace in the region. Hezbollah, unprovoked, during the October 7 attack, launching rockets into Israel. Almost a year later, two men on each side of the Israeli-Lebanon border remain displaced. Full-scale war is not in anyone's interest. Even if the situation has escalated, a diplomatic solution is still possible. Netanyahu is scheduled to speak at the U.N. this week. It's expected he'll make a robust call for Israel's right to self-defense, eliminating the threat from Hezbollah and returning more than 60,000 Israelis to their homes. Well, I don't see a negotiated peace here, and the reason is the ideology is just too strong. They've been brainwashed into thinking wiping Israel off the map is achievable. And when Yahya Senwar, the head of Hamas, says we have Israel right where we want them, and, and he does that from... Uh, a deep tunnel, it, it makes you question what in the world are the, these people thinking? They're not trying to protect civilians. They want to use civilians as shields. They want to launch attack after attack uh, against Israel. And we should all wake up to it and say, well, we're not going to fund you. That, that would be number one. And then we're going to stand with Israel to make sure this can never happen again. We vowed it after the Holocaust, after World War II, and here it is on our doorstep again, an ideology of hatred that wants to wipe Israel out. Genesis 16, 1 through 12. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go. Go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Then Sarai said to Abram, My wrong be upon you. I gave my maid into your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram said to Sarai, Indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Genesis chapter 16 began a prophecy about the baby Hagar is carrying. It is a boy, and she is to call him Ishmael. The rest of the prophecy is less favorable. Even though Ishmael will be the first son born to Abram through the Gentile maidservant Hagar, God's promises went to Isaac, Abram's second born, with his true wife Sarai. Though Ishmael will become a great nation, his people will live in conflict with everyone just as we are witnessing today. 
His hand will be against everyone, and everyone will be against him. He will live in hostility to his kinsmen. We learn that Ishmael's descendants become the Arabic people. These cultures have been at odds with the Jewish people for millennia. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. In his final speech to the United Nations, President Biden continued to call for a two-state solution in the Middle East. Gordon, while the president said strong alliances are needed to stand for freedom against aggression from Russia and Iran, he also repeated his call for a Palestinian state. As Israeli bombardment continues across Lebanon, President Biden used part of his speech at the United Nations to urge both sides to embrace peace and agree to a two-state solution. Where Israel enjoys security and peace and full recognition and normalize relations with all its neighbors. Where Palestinians live in security, dignity, and self-determination in a state of their own. Biden also addressed the threat posed by Iran which backs both Hamas and Hezbollah and is reportedly racing to acquire a nuclear weapon. Together we must deny oxygen to, terror, to its terrorist proxies, which have called for more October 7th and ensure that Iran will never, ever obtain a nuclear weapon. The president also touched on U.S.-China relations, saying both countries need to make sure that trade rivalry does not escalate into something more dangerous. On the Ukraine front, the White House continues to condemn Moscow for its attacks against civilians. The Kremlin increasingly relies on short-range ballistic missiles and drones from Tehran, as well as North Korea, to wage its brutal war against Ukraine. With Ukraine's president listening in the audience, Biden called on the global community to stand firm against Moscow. We cannot grow weary. We cannot look away, and we will not let up on our support for Ukraine. This was the president's last address before the assembly as he prepares to leave office in four months amidst global tensions on multiple fronts. The upcoming election in 40 days is shaping up to be pivotal, particularly with the stark contrast in foreign policy views between the candidates. A new survey shows voters are clearly divided on the U.S. role in the world. According to the Institute for Global Affairs at the Eurasia Group, 58 percent of Harris supporters think the U.S. should maintain or increase forces overseas, while 58 percent of Trump supporters said the U.S. should draw back. President Biden used part of his speech at the United Nations to urge both sides to embrace peace and agree to a two-state solution. World, where Israel enjoys security and peace and full recognition and normalize relations with all its neighbors, where Palestinians live in security, dignity, and self-determination in a state of their own. First Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. God gives the most dire warning to the nations who would divide up his land, as we read in Joel 3, 1 and 2, and Zechariah 12, 8 and 9. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them, in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God. 
like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Psalm 917 The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. In northern Argentina, it's a race to safety as wildfires rage across the region and the continent defying borders. The infernos turning deadly in Peru, killing at least 15 people and scorching through more than 120,000 acres of rainforest. In Bolivia, families like this one forced to evacuate, leaving everything they know behind. Bolivian cattle ranchers desperately try to protect their herds, already losing several to the flames. And in Ecuador, it's pets that families don't want to leave behind. While in Brazil, fires burn across two massive areas, including the Amazon. The continent seeing 346,000 wildfire hotspots this year, according to Brazil's space agency, the highest number on record. NASA imagery showing the vast scale of those fires blanketing the continent. Hotter and drier weather due to climate change, experts say, has made fire conditions more dangerous in recent years. Brazil currently experiencing a relentless drought, low water levels drying out habitats enough to beach and kill dolphins in the Amazon and create tinderbox conditions. New data shows that June, July and August were the warmest on record globally. The warming climate is tied to more deadly heat waves, destructive wildfires, and stronger hurricanes. So what do these new numbers show? Well, they're not good, Nate. Around the globe, temperatures were more than 2.2 degrees Fahrenheit above the historical average, a new record for the three months from June to August. California and Arizona set new statewide records for their hottest summer, both five degrees above the 20th century average. In Phoenix, Temperatures soared to 110 or hotter for 61 days this year, breaking the previous record. The city also saw 113 consecutive days at the century mark this summer. The record heat also reached the Arctic coast of Alaska. On August 6, the town of Dead Horse got up to a high of 89 degrees. That is 37 degrees above normal. But the standout from the summer, it actually occurred on July 22nd, and that is when the planet hit a new benchmark for the hottest temperature reaching 17.16 degrees Celsius or about 63 degrees of Fahrenheit. To date, global temperatures are trending above last year, and that has experts concerned because 2023 was the hottest calendar year in history, and the top 10 hottest years have all happened in just the last decade. And with just over three months remaining in 2024, Norris says there is now a 97% chance, Nate, that this year will surpass 2023 as the warmest on record. As we look at the news, there is no doubt we are in the birth pains Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, 8. We see many of God's remedial judgments manifesting, as if God is warning us of things to come and calling on people to repent. We see war and rumors of wars, famine and pestilence resulting in the deaths of thousands around the world. We are seeing earthquakes, extreme heat, floods, wildfires, tornadoes, hailstorms, and hurricanes, all at record levels of frequency and intensity, just like Jesus said would happen just prior to his return. The judgments God will use to punish mankind with during the seven-year tribulation will be much worse than any of us can imagine. Still, this is God's grace and mercy, proving to everyone that these judgments come from him, and he is still offering forgiveness of sins through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I implore you to do so today, as we are not guaranteed tomorrow. Now, Tropical Storm John, which made landfall in Mexico's southern Pacific coast on Monday as a Category 3 hurricane, unleashed heavy rains as it moved inland, causing at least three deaths with dangerous levels of flooding expected. By Tuesday morning, the remnants of the storm brought strong winds and dumped heavy rain of over 250 millimeters on parts of Guerrero and Oaxaca, two of the poorest states in Mexico. Two people died after a mudslide buried a house, while a woman was also killed when a wall collapsed on her house, with all three deaths reportedly occurring in Guerrero State. The storm made landfall as a Category 3 hurricane, with wind speeds of up to 200 kilometers per hour on Monday, raising fears of a repeat of Hurricane Otis last October, which quickly transformed from a tropical storm into a Category 5 hurricane and devastated the coast of Oaxaca to Acapulco. Forecasters predict heavy rain of up to 500 millimetres through, through Thursday in the region, with a high risk of flash flooding and mudslides. 
Following record rainfall in Japan's Noto region over the weekend, at least seven people have reportedly died in Ishikawa Prefecture as the torrential downpours caused mudslides and flooding. The city of Wajima saw a record rainfall of 121 millimeters in one hour on Saturday morning, while neighboring Suzu City saw 84.5 millimeters in one hour. Thousands of homes were washed away by flooding in the Romanian county of Galati leaving thousands displaced. Romanian towns, roads and bridges have been devastated by the recent extreme weather and accompanying loss of life. While the water has receded, houses full of mud have been left behind. Homes, goods and furniture were destroyed. In Italy, the cleanup began in Emilia Romana. Volunteers came to help those heavily affected by the weather. The extent of the damage is still being evaluated, but on Friday, Italian Premier Giorgio Meloni's government approved an initial allocation of 20 million euros in aid. Heavy rains in Italy's central Tuscany region have continued to cause havoc, with many evacuated from their homes. Two foreign tourists, a five-month-old baby and his grandmother were missing on Tuesday after floods hit overnight. Italian authorities said rescuers searched for the two using divers, rescue dogs and drones. According to firefighters, the baby's parents and grandfather were rescued. Meanwhile, parts of the UK were submerged by flash floods after some areas saw up to two months worth of rainfall in two days. Roads were closed, some train lines in London were suspended, while dozens of people in central and southern England reported their houses being submerged. Extreme weather has wreaked havoc across Europe this year with high temperatures, intense storms and flooding impacting various regions. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish.
God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.